Hello, I'm Pastor Greg with Northview Church, and I want to welcome you to NVC Anywhere. We are so happy that you've chose to join us today for worship, and we hope that you enjoy your time with us through the music, through the Word, and we pray that God blesses you through today's service. Now, we want NVC Anywhere not to just be uh, another streaming worship service that you watch online. We want to interact with you. So drop your, your questions or your comments in, in the comment section. Or better yet, go over to mynorthview.online.church and join us on our new platform where you can interact with us, where you can share prayer requests, where you can share your praises, and you can join us uh, in worship in a very interactive way on the new platform. Whether you're with us on Facebook or whether you're with us on YouTube or on our new platform, we are so happy that you have joined us today. And now, let's worship together. You know, making disciples and making sure that you as a follower of Jesus have a foundation for your faith 
is one of our primary goals here at Northview Church. As a matter of fact, our mission statement is making disciples who are growing in their love for Jesus and for people. And we believe to do that, you need to have a foundation for your faith to be built on. You need to know the truths of the, of the faith. So we've been going through, as a church, something called a catechism for the first few weeks of this year. And a catechism is just a series of questions and answers that are backed up by Scripture that lay a foundation and give you a, a theological basis for our faith. So if you'd follow along with me for this week's catechism question and answer. Here's today's question. What does the law of God require? Now the answer to that question is this, that we live in full obedience to God's commands and that we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbors as ourselves. Now we don't just want to throw a, a, a truth out there without backing it up through Scripture. We believe everything has to be backed up through the Bible. So here is today's passage that backs up our catechism question and answer. And it's this. It comes out of Matthew chapter 22 beginning in verse 37. And He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So as you think about the question and the answer from that catechism and the truth from that passage of Scripture begins to sink into your heart, we encourage you to meditate on that this week, to, to pray over that during your quiet time, and to memorize that question and answer. And just let that get deep into your soul as you're building a foundation for your faith in Jesus Christ. And if you would like to, to see those questions and answers, maybe you're behind or maybe you just want to, to follow up on what they are, you can jump over on our website at mynorthview.church slash the hub and click on Catechism and it will take you to all of the questions and answers that we've had so far this year. Now that we've done that, let's continue this morning worshiping our Savior.
Maybe the biggest buzzword in our society right now is this word, unity. We hear it all the time, unity. We talk about being united. We hear that we need to be unified. All, all, everywhere that we turn, we're hearing this term or some uh, derivative of it of unity. You know, we hear it from our politicians. Our politicians are screaming for the need that we have for unity. But at the same time, they're seeking to destroy each other. We hear our, our celebrities that we, we see, movie stars, singers, athletes, all these celebrities that we'll see on social media or on television, and they're talking about our need for unity. But at the same time, we see them canceling people who don't agree or disagree with their beliefs. We see protests that have this idea that they want to bring unity, while at the same time, they're burning down businesses, or they're attacking police, or they're invading government institutions. Now, this isn't a, a blue or a red thing. This isn't a black or a white thing. This is a, an idea of unity, and it's happening on both sides that we see this disunity. Where is the unity? Now, we don't see it a lot but we still love the idea of unity. That's why it's being talked about so much. We love the idea of unity and we love stories that are all about unity. There's a, it's one of my favorite movies, one of the all-time classic movies, especially as far as sports movies go, and it's Remember the Titans starring Denzel Washington. Now this, this movie, it tells the true story or it's based on a true story of the newly integrated T.C. Williams High School in Virginia. And as this school has become integrated, they have hired a black football coach to be the head coach named Herman Boone. Now, because of this, tensions are rising even higher in this movie than they already were. There is disunity going on in this movie. Over the course of the, the beginning of this movie, Herman Boone hires a, an assistant coach by the name of Bill Yost. And, and Bill Yost was a Hall of Fame candidate coach for the, the High School Sports Hall of Fame in the state of Virginia. And he was passed over for the job that Herman Boone got. So Herman Boone offers him this assistant coach job and, and he accepts it. But he doesn't accept it because he wants the job per se. He accepts it to be there to look out for his former players. The racial tension between these players, it's palpable all throughout the, the, the movie, especially the beginning of the movie. There, there's no way they can even get through a practice without a fight, much less the prospect of a game. So Coach Boone, he brings his team to a, a camp at Gettysburg College. And they go through these intense practices and these intense physical workouts. And the players, as they see each other battling through all this, they begin to gain a little bit of respect for each other. Now, early one morning, Coach Boone decides he's going to take his players out for a run. And they go out on this really early morning run and they end up at the battlefield from Gettysburg. And as they're at that battlefield, Coach Boone gives this motivational speech. And, and after this speech, the players begin to look past their skin color, to look past their differences, and to begin looking at their similarities. They come away from this camp unified as a football team. And even with all these odds that are stacked against them, with the refs and the officials throughout this movie cheating to make sure that they lose, with the taunting and the attacks that they face outside of the games. The Titans of T.C. Williams High School, they go undefeated and they win the 1971 state championship for the state of Virginia. The music soars at the end of this movie as, as it's coming to a close. The emotions are, are high and the audience, 
Well, we're satisfied with this outcome. It makes us feel good. Unity has been achieved. Purpose unifies. We love stories that unify us. But is unity really possible? You know, even for a story as great as Remember the Titans, much of the story was fabricated by Hollywood. The, the racial unrest that's depicted in the movie, sure, it, it was present, but all accounts, many who were there, say that the cheating never happened. That the protests that are depicted on the, the first day of school, they didn't happen. And much to my dismay, that whole scene at the battlefield of Gettysburg, well, it never happened either. Even so, it was a big story at the time. President Nixon said that the Titans were the football team that saved Alexandria, Virginia. But in reality, unity wasn't really there. Just a few short years later, Herman Boone was fired from his job as football coach. And the racial unrest, the community unrest was still present. Unity is, it's today's buzzword. But how do we achieve it? Is it even possible to get there? You know, as we look back at the early church in Scripture, there were clear lines of tension between different groups of people. There was racial division. There were the Jews opposed to the Gentiles. And a Gentile is, well, anyone who's not a Jew. There were racial divisions between those groups. And even within that group of Gentiles, there were divisions. And even within the group of Jews, there were divisions. There were tons of divisions going on at this time. But Paul writes to address this in Ephesians chapter 2. So follow along with me, beginning in chapter 2, verse 11. And here's what Paul says. Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathens by the Jews. They were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship among the people of Israel. And you did not know the covenant promises God had made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. You see, God had chosen way back in the book of Genesis, He chose the Israelites. He chose to work through the people of Abraham to deliver all the people of the world and restore them to Himself. But the Jews, for the most part, Well, they were proud of being chosen. They were God's chosen people. And they weren't all that interested in sharing that position with the Gentiles. They they said that the Gentiles were heathens. They looked at the Gentiles as being less than them. They had no right to be a part of God's family. They were not chosen as the Jews were. And Paul makes no bones about the position of the Gentiles before God. He says they had no hope because they had no God. Now they had gods that they had created, but the God of the universe had not chosen them. They did not have a relationship to this God. No, Paul doesn't let the Jews off the hook though. He says... That this choosing, this circumcision that they went through because of their choosing, well, it affected their bodies, but it changed nothing in their hearts. There had to be an answer. You see, the Jews and the Gentiles, they had the same problem. And the problem was sin. We all have this same problem. It's the same problem, and they all needed the same solution. Let's look at this. Verse 13. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you have been brought near to Him through the blood of Jesus Christ. 
Paul says, the Gentiles, they have no hope. He says they have no God. The Jews, they have God, but they have little relationship with God. It's just legalism, sticking to the laws for them. All of them. They have the same problem, and that problem has the same solution. They have the same problem in sin, and they have the same solution in a Savior. When, when there was no hope, Jesus gave hope. When there was no relationship, Jesus drew them near to Him to have relationship. It's the same problem that have the same solution, and His name is Jesus. That is the solution. Verses, beginning in verse 14. For Christ Himself was, has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles, but creating in himself one new people from two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of His death on the cross. And our hostility toward each other was put to death. He brought this good news of peace to you Gentiles who were far away from Him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. We look at our society today and we see all these problems that we have in our society today and all of the division that we have. And we think, man, it is bad. And it is. It, it is bad. But this isn't a new thing. This isn't just us that has dealt with this. This division among people groups, it has existed since the beginning of time. So how do we fix it? We look and as a people, we're like, well, let's get a commission together and, and come up with some solutions. Or we'll say, let's just force people to meet together and maybe they'll resolve their differences. Or let's pass some laws because people need to be held accountable. Or we look to our leaders and, and it's like, Give us a great motivational speech or lead some protests. Do something. Change something. And now, none of that is bad. All of those are things that it can bring some attention, some awareness to whatever problem you're trying to bring light to. But no divided culture has ever been united through a speech or through a protest and definitely not from a new law or a statement from a commission. So if that's the case and all these things, they're not going to bring unity, what do we do? How do we bring unity? It's really pretty simple. We have the same problem, which is sin. All of our actions for unity, they have some great intentions, but none of them address the problem of sin. The inherent problem in all of our, our issues is sin. Racial division, political division, class division. It is all rooted in sin and sin from both sides of the issues. Whether you're black or white, your nature is sin. Whether you're red or blue, your nature is sin. Whether you're rich or poor, your nature is sin. Sin is what we really have in common. Sin is what is normal. But Jesus doesn't want you to be normal. He wants you to be His. The problem is sin. And the only solution is a Savior. 
And his name is Jesus. Unity. It's not found in protests or laws or great speeches. Unity is only found in the cross. It is the death and resurrection of Christ that a bridge is built not only to unite us with our Savior, but it should unite us with each other. It is only the cross that unifies. In the cross, the Savior unites us with Himself. And then He does something that is truly miraculous. Verse 19. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are His house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus Himself. We are carefully joined together in Him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through Him, you Gentiles are also being made part of the dwelling where God lives by His Spirit. The beauty of what Christ does in us is that it doesn't stop with restoring us to Himself. He unites us together as believers. Back in verse 14, Paul talks about this dividing wall or this line of hostility that's there. And this wasn't just a metaphor that Paul was using. There was literally a line in the temple that the Gentiles could not cross. There was literally a line that they were not allowed to pass. If you were not a Jew, you were not allowed to enter beyond that point. And it it was intended to keep the unholy out of the temple. But the effects were more division. Paul says that in Christ, that's all gone. Now you are united together. You are on the same team. Jews and Gentiles, all races, all classes, all political allegiances. You are united together in Christ. We are united as, as Paul says, as His house. We are united as His holy temple. We are the church and Christ is the cornerstone that holds it all together. So here's the glaring truth from this passage. We are meant to be a united, unified gathering of believers, not a pocket of individual believers. There is no such thing as a mature Christian who is not connected to the church. This just doesn't mean that you only attend church or that you only are engaged online. It means you are fully connected. It means you are fully engaged. It means you are a working part of the church. This this passage, it talks about us being a, a temple. But the church, it's not a building. The church is a living, breathing temple of the Lord. The church is you. The church is me. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are the church. Paul puts it a little bit better, I think. Breaks it down even more to where we can understand it even more in the book of Colossians verse chapter 1, verse 18. He says... Christ is also the head of the church, which is His body. So, if Christ is the head and we are the church, which means we are His body, that means we are the hands of Christ. We do the work of Christ. We are the feet of Christ. It means that the head, Christ, it communicates to us how we should breathe life into a dead 
and dying world. It, it means that the head, Christ, directs us where we need to go, what we need to do. It even get, he even gives us the words that we need to say. But when we're disconnected from the body, we're dead. The hand has no idea how to work. It's not receiving any communication from the body. The feet, they have no direction on where to walk. The, they simply are dead. And they are apart from the church. The reality of this passage is, is that we can't have Christ without the church. But I can, I can connect with the Lord in my living room. I can connect with the Lord at the lake or, or when I'm hiking or when I'm in the mountains. Of course you can. We could and should connect with the Lord in every place that we're at in life. I'm not saying also that you can't be saved without being in the church. I'm saying you aren't part of a mission if you're not part of the church. I'm saying that if you want to be a fully mature disciple, you can't be a fully mature disciple apart from the church. There is no such thing as a mature Christian who is not connected to the church. The church, as a body of believers, it's not perfect all the time. The church is full of people, and people make mistakes. We are all hypocrites. We're all espousing one thing and then doing the opposite. But the church is the design that God has given us to become fully mature disciples and to be a part of the mission. You see, we, we all have the same problem. We all have the same solution. And the solution, His name is Jesus and His body is the church. The cross, it is the only thing that unifies. And the church, it's the embodiment of that unity. We can look around at our world and the normal that we see. What we see is everyday normalcy is dysfunction. It's disunity. We yell at each other. We cancel each other. We share our opinions, but we really don't care what yours is. And then we cry, unity. That's what we call normal. You were never meant to be normal. You were meant to be His. And as His, you are meant to be a part of the body of the church. The early church, it was united in mission. And that mission, well, it changed the world. That's why 2,000 years later, we are still talking about them. And it's nothing they did. It's what Christ did through them as the church. Your mission, it's exactly the same. But you can't be a successful part of the mission if you are not a part of the church. It is God's design for the church to be the tool of His mission. This is how He reaches people. Not because it's the only way He can, but because He wanted to include His people in the mission. And He knows we can't do it alone. We need each other to encourage each other. The church is His body. And if you are a disciple and you're not connected and engaged in the church, you're crippling yourself. And you're crippling the body. The church. 
Hebrews chapter 10 speaks to the importance of the church in verse 24 and 25. The writer of Hebrews says, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another. That's the church. We shouldn't neglect meeting together. We are the church. We are the body of Jesus Christ. We are the tool to complete His mission. We are in this together. It is only a, as a part of the body of believers that real unity can be found. The church, it brings together all races. We see here, it brought together the Jews and the Gentiles into one new people group. It unites all races. It unites all backgrounds. It unites all classes, all people. And it unifies us together on a mission. Unity. Well, that's today's buzzword. The church is the only place it can be found. The church is the only place that it can truly happen. And God's calling each of you to be a part of it. The first step is, is committing your life to Christ. To be a part of the body of Christ is to realize that you are someone who needs a Savior. That there is sin in your life that separates you. There is a problem. We have the same problem and it is sin. And the solution is a Savior and His name's Jesus. The first part of being a part of this mission, the first step is committing your life to Him, accepting Him as your Savior. And if, there's, if that's a step that you're ready to take, please reach out to us. Send us a private message or, or hit us up in the, the chat below. Or if you're following us on, on the new online.church platform, then make sure you click the button that says, I've decided. That's the first step. But the next step is getting plugged into a local congregation. Maybe that's Northview Church, but maybe it's somewhere else. God's calling you to be a part of a, a local congregation. And, and maybe you're watching this on your, online and you're like, well, I can't get there on Sundays. Maybe meeting online is the only place that it works for you right now. That's what NVC Anywhere is. It's a place that we, we want to engage you so that you can be a part of the church and not just a bystander watching it from afar. You can still engage you can be a part of the mission. You can engage in Bible studies and prayer groups throughout the week. Don't just sit back and watch. Engage. Be a part of the church. And if NVC anywhere or Northview Church meeting in person is where God is calling you, at this moment in time in your life to be at this, in this season of life, we would love to have you on board as we go about the mission. We are a church whose mission is making disciples who are growing in their love for Jesus and people. We would love to be on mission with you. And if you would like to be a part of this body of believers, we would love to have you. Just let us know in the comments and we can follow up with you on, on what that process looks like. Whether it's here or whether it's somewhere else, God's calling you to be a part of the church. Unity only happens through the cross. Unity is only available in the church. Let's pray. God in heaven, we thank you so much for the church and we thank you so much that you have called us to be a part of the mission and that through you we can be a unified group of people. Lord, 
The world is looking at us now. Let us be the example. Lord, I pray for those who are watching who are not a part of a local church. God, that You are leading them where You want them to be. I pray that You are giving them courage to reach out right now, not to waste another moment, to jump in the chat or to send a private message right now asking how to be a part of a church. Even if it's not here, we can walk them through that process. Lord, I pray for those who who they need to take the first step, commit their life to You. God, I pray that they're seeing that the hope is only in You. That all of us have this, this problem, the same problem of sin, but we all have the same solution in Jesus Christ as our Savior. God, I pray for those who are seeking You, that You right now will show them the need for You, that You give them courage to click that I have decided button, to send a private message, to call someone who they know is a believer, whatever it is, Lord, that You save them. It's in Your name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for joining us today. I hope that you have been blessed through the the music. I hope you've been blessed through the Word. I hope that God has spoken to you today. And as we close, we close with with an opportunity for you to be a part of the mission. It's worship through giving. We believe that God has called us to give of our first fruits, of our tithes and offerings, of all that He has provided us. So this is your opportunity to participate in that mission. We've got a couple of ways that you can give here at Northview Church. You can always do it the old-fashioned way. If you're in town here in Kodak, you can drop by the church and just leave a, a cash or check or whatever it is. But if you're like most of us, you do most of your giving, most of your spending and giving, buying, all that stuff digitally, you can do that giving as well. You can text the amount that you would like to give, any amount, to the number 84321. Or you can just jump on our website at mynorthview.church, click on Give, and it will walk you through the whole process. We are so thankful that you have joined us today. We pray that your week is incredibly blessed. We pray that you find your home in a local church. Thank you for being here. We can't wait to see you soon. We love you. Have a great week.